Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's session of your gastrointestinal system course. I'm Dr. Sally, and today we're going to be covering the nerve supply of the gastrointestinal system. So let's just get right into it. The nerve supply of the GIT is divided into two types, depending on where it's coming from. Okay? Um, so we can consider what we call intrinsic nerve supply of the GIT, and that's basically referring to nerves that are found within the gastrointestinal system itself, and we actually call that the enteric nervous system. The other source of nerve supply is extrinsic, which is basically nerve supply that's coming from somewhere outside the GIT, and we'll consider that as the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. So, like I said, the enteric nervous system is basically the nerves that are found within the wall of the GIT, and if you've been through the histology of the GIT lecture, you uh, you should be familiar with these. So we're basically talking about the nerve plexuses that are found within the um, the wall of the GIT, which are the submucosal plexus of Messner and the myenteric plexus of Auerbach. Okay. So you can see in this picture they've just uh, giving you like the nerve plexuses within the walls of the GIT. So the enteric nervous system is a system of neurons that control the functions of the GIT. It is composed of about 500 million neurons, and these extend from the esophagus all the way to the anus, and is subdivided into our back plexus, which we've already touched on before. This is referred to as the myenteric plexus. Our back's plexus is located between the circular and longitudinal muscles of the muscularis propria, which, if you remember, were the muscles that are responsible for peristalsis. And what this plexus does is that it provides motor input to these layers. So it basically controls the contractions that are happening in the circular and longitudinal muscles. And, excuse me, it makes them happen in a way that the uh, peristaltic movements and wave-like contractions of the GIT happen normally. The other plexus is Messner's plexus, which is a collection of nerves that are found in the submucosal layer. So that's why we sometimes refer to it as the submucosal plexus as well. And the submucosal plexus, like we've mentioned before, controls the secretions of the blood. So therefore, the functions of the enteric nervous system are to control the motor function of the GIT, which is peristaltic, as well as controlling the glandular secretions of the GIT. The enteric nervous system is sometimes referred to as the second brain or the mini brain, okay? Uh, basically because of its bulk and its uh, size and the number of neurons that it has. And... The responses of the enteric nervous system, so basically whether it causes contraction or relaxation, whether it causes certain secretions to be increased or decreased, okay, this depends on the bulk of the food, like how much food is in the GIT, as well as its nutritional composition. Um, and one of the reasons that the enteric nervous system is referred to as the second brain is because it has several features that are similar to the features of the central nervous system. And these are that it can function independent of autonomic input. So basically it has its own control system. Okay. It has its own afferent, efferent, and interneurons. Okay. Remember, afferent neurons are neurons that are going into a certain organ. Efferent neurons are neurons that are coming out of an organ. And interneurons are neurons that connect between, you know, these two. So what afferent neurons do is that they pick up mechanical and chemical conditions. So basically, if there's any stretch happening in the GIT, if there's any change in chemical composition of the food, okay, and then they will send uh, certain messages and then they will end up uh, like sending impulses in order to control the functions of the GIT to the efferent neurons which control uh, peristalsis. So basically the efferent neurons are then going to go to the muscles and then they're going to control the amount of contraction that happens. Okay? 
The other feature that is similar between the inherent nervous system and the central nervous system is that the neurons communicate with each other through neurotransmitters uh, such as acetylcholine, dopamine, and serotonin. All right, so these are the features that make the inherent nervous system similar to the central nervous system. Okay, next we're going to look at the parasympathetic innervation of the GIT. Okay, so what we're looking at here is basically a representation of the GIT, okay, as well as the spinal cord, all right? And what this picture is indicating is that the parasympathetic innervation of the GIT comes from two places, okay? The first one is something called the vagus nerve, which is basically a cranial nerve that originates from the part of the central nervous system called the medulla oblongata, okay? And so the vagus nerve is going to pass from the uh, brain stem or the medulla oblongata, it's gonna pass down the neck, the thorax, and then eventually it's going to be distributed to the various parts of the uh, GIT. And in this picture, anything that's colored in green is going to be supplied by the vagus nerve, okay? The rest or the second source of the parasympathetic innervation to the GIT comes from the sacral segment of the spinal cord, okay? And these are going to be uh, carried through the pelvic nerve to this part of the GIT that's colored in red here, okay? So the proximal parts of the GIT, so basically anything that was in green here, so the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the duodenum, and so forth, they receive their parasympathetic innervation through the vagus nerve. The rest of the GIT, so basically the, uh, the sigmoid colon, the rectum, the anus, they receive their parasympathetic innervation from the sacral segment of the spinal cord through the pelvic nerve. Now, the parasympathetic input or parasympathetic innervation has specific effects on the GIT, which include increased motility, increased secretions, increased blood flow, and relaxation of sphincters. So basically think of the parasympathetic effect of the GIT, sorry, on the GIT, uh, is anything that promotes digestion. Okay, so if you want to increase the amount of digestion that's happening, anything that can help that process is a parasympathetic effect. Okay, um, and then finally, we're going to look at the sympathetic innervation. Now, similar to the parasympathetic innervation, the sympathetic innervation of the GIT comes from a certain segment of the spinal cord. Okay, now the idea behind the sympathetic innervation is that you've got multiple nerves or multiple nerve sources, okay, coming out of the spinal cord carrying the sympathetic innervation. Now, what needs to happen is that these nerves need to be organized okay, in order for them to reach the specific parts of the GIT that they need to reach, okay? So what's going to happen is the sympathetic nerves are going to come out of the spinal cord, okay, and they're going to go, oh, sorry, the nerves are going to come out of the spinal cord, and then they're going to go through a certain structure that's found next to the vertebral column. This is called the sympathetic chain, okay? And then the sympathetic chain will then send them to certain structures that are again found in front of the vertebral column called the prevertebral sympathetic ganglia, okay? And so just think of these ganglia as like stop points, okay, that receive all the nerves that are, are intended to reach the GIT. And then what they do is they distribute them to the different organs, okay? So basically, the nerves come out of the spinal cord, they pass through the sympathetic chain, and they need to be collected in these stop points, which are called the ganglia. And then what the ganglia are going to do are they're going to distribute them to the various parts or the various organs of the GIT, okay? Uh, the ganglia are three in number, and they are usually found like within the region of the artery. So that's why we usually give them the same name. So you've got the celiac ganglia, and the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric. So the sympathetic innervation comes from the sympathetic segments or sympathetic ganglia. 
from C5 up until L2 segments of the spinal cord. They communicate with the enteric plexus. So one of the ways that the sympathetic innervation works is that it communicates with the enteric plexus, the mesmer plexus, and our back plexus. Okay. The sympathetic innervation to the GIT has the opposite effect of the parasympathetic innervation, meaning that the sympathetic impulses or sympathetic innervation reduces digestion. So what it does is it causes decreased motility, decrease in the level of secretion, secretion, sorry, uh, decrease in blood flow and contraction of sphincter. So anything that prevents or decreases the amount of digestion that's happening is usually a sympathetic effect of the uh, innervation of the GIT. Okay? So that is just a quick summary of the innervation of the GIT. Um, I hope that session was useful for you. Um, and as always, I will be available if you have any questions or things that you need to ask. And I will see you guys next time.